Hello friends, good afternoon and welcome to the EduSat Network. Our topic of discussion today shall be Rise of Buddhism and Jainism and for this very lecture we have in our studio subject expert Dr. Shankar Kumar, Assistant Professor, Department of History, Hindu College, University of Delhi. His uh, specialization includes ancient Indian history and culture amongst uh, many others and uh, Dr. Kumar uh, was awarded the Innovation uh, Project 2013-14 to by the University of Delhi and the Vice Chancellor's uh, Fellowship uh, by the same uh, in uh, 2014. And with this uh, brief uh, set of introduction, I would like to welcome sir to the studio. Hello sir, good afternoon and welcome. Thank you Urvashi uh, and good afternoon viewers. Uh, today, uh, we shall be talking about the uh, rise of uh, Jainism and Buddhism in uh, Indian history. And uh, this refers to the chronological bracket of 6th century BC, uh, 100 years around this. And uh, this is significant. In fact, uh, this period uh, is uh, regarded almost unanimously by the uh, practitioners of uh, ancient India as the most uh, important and almost the axial period of ancient Indian history on account of several changes that uh, this, uh, uh, this uh, period triggered and uh, not only changes with respect to this century but changes uh, which, were, uh, which were to stay as part of our history and culture for a uh, significantly long period of time, quite a few cities which uh, emerged uh, in this century for the first time continue to thrive as cities even today in India, uh, particularly in uh, the uh, North uh, Indian context, the Gangetic Belt and so on. Also true is the fact that uh, quite a few religious practices uh, which uh, emerged in this century, uh, for the first time, uh, in, in uh, some kind of a contrast to the ongoing uh, uh, Brahmanical way of uh, life and religion, uh, those sentiments, those sensibilities are very much present even today. And uh, therefore, the emergence of Buddhism and Jainism uh, in 6th century BC North India is uh, extremely important from a historical point of view, uh, from the point of view of understanding as to how uh, Indian uh, society and religion uh, evolved over a period of time, uh, what, what uh, all issues uh, these uh, movements uh, to begin with, uh, because uh, uh, when we are talking of uh, Jainism and Buddhism in the context of 6th century BC, let us understand that it is not uh, uh, in the form of some kind of a formal organized religion, because uh, that, that uh, required more time, it, it uh, only gradually assumed that form. But uh, in this century, it was more in the form of a, a social religious movement. So, uh, there is a lot of dynamism to uh, what we are going to talk about today. Uh, so, uh, 6th century BC is uh, extremely important. There, of course, are several other connotations uh, with respect to historical changes uh, in 6th century BC. There is, uh, as we discussed, there is uh, the issue of uh, urbanization, which is regarded in Indian historiography as the second urbanization, the first being uh, referred to uh, for the Harappan uh, uh, scenario. Uh, so, uh, this is a uh, second urbanization period. This is also the uh, period where uh, agriculture had uh, assumed uh, center stage. It became the mainstay of uh, Indian economy and uh, it had uh, uh, replaced or it had uh, one can say uh, sidelined pastoralism as the uh, dominant way of life which was uh, the case in the earlier period that is the Vedic, uh, early Vedic and the later Vedic period. So, uh, uh, these are some of the issues trade and commerce uh, became extremely important. Coins, metallic coins for the first time uh, emerged only in this century. Uh, 
because even for Harappa, we uh, do not encounter metallic coins as such. Of course, we do understand that there must have been uh, some uh, unit of exchange uh, because the Harappan uh, situation was also very urban and there was a lot of uh, inter-regional uh, transactions happening. So, there must have been some kind of a medium, but uh, in pure tangible form, material form, this is only around 6th century BC that we start getting uh, the evidence of metallic coins in the form of uh, the iconic uh, uh, punch mark coins which were usually made of silver. <coughs> Also important is uh, the fact that uh, rice cultivation uh, became important uh, in 6th century BC, particularly the transplantation of rice and all these things, all these changes in the realm of uh, society and economy had uh, a lot to uh, do with uh, the kind of issue that we are going to take up today, the rise of Jainism and Buddhism. In fact, uh, in terms of uh, sources. Uh, because uh, that is how uh, we uh, as students of history uh, understand uh, the flavor of changing times. So, what is it that, uh, that appears to be different uh, so far as uh, historical sources are concerned uh, related to this period 6th century BC. And this is the entry point, this is where we do get some kind of a different uh, world altogether in 6th century BC and that uh, uh, sets in, that kicks in uh, uh, analysis uh, of uh, various kinds by different scholars who try to understand as to what was it uh, in this century which brought about uh, this kind of a change that we get to see in our sources. So, uh, uh, if you refer to uh, my earlier discussion with you related to the Vedic times, uh, you would uh, uh, recall that uh, we had been saying that uh, uh, essentially people uh, were dependent on uh, uh, their cattle wealth, uh, it was the pastoral way of life which was the dominant uh, pattern of economy and uh, it is only towards the later Vedic times that we start getting evidence, more and more evidence of grains and cultivation related activities. But it is only around 6th century BC that we find that agriculture had come to become the mainstay of economy uh, displacing uh, pastoralism as the uh, dominant way of life in terms of economy. And uh, therefore, uh, the sources uh, that, we, uh, that we look at uh, become uh, more diverse uh, and uh, even if we, uh, if we keep aside uh, the uh, Buddhist and Jain sources, contemporary Buddhist and Jain sources, we do find even within the Brahmanical texts, we uh, encounter some kind of a change in the thought process, in the way people thought about the world, in the way people uh, imagined their gods, uh, in the way uh, major uh, spiritual preoccupations uh, uh, changed uh, during this time and so forth. So, uh, what we get here is uh, uh, in the Brahmanical tradition is Upanishads. Now, of course, Upanishads are part uh, of the same uh, Vedic tradition. So, there is no kind of a deliberate uh, distanciation of Upanishads with the Vedic tradition. Nevertheless, if we read the Vedic sources, if we re read the Vedic texts alongside Upanishads, we uh, it is very easy to make out that uh, Upanishads uh, uh, probably belong to a very changed scenario because uh, uh, here uh, it is uh, not the usual anthropomorphic gods who are uh, being referred to or uh, the deities uh, who uh, embody actually uh, the natural forces like Indra, Agni, Vayu and so forth which uh, were the gods, uh, important gods in the Vedic times. So, they are, uh, they are not of much of a concern for uh, Upanishadic text, uh, rather uh, the tone and tenor of uh, Upanishad is a little bit different. It, uh, it resorts to uh, metaphysics more. It, 
it is more abstract, it is not very direct the way it was uh, in the Vedic uh, text. For instance, uh, we had uh, said uh, that uh, in the Vedic hymns, uh, the uh, offering and the expected return from uh, gods uh, are, uh, are rather direct. So, uh, one offers something to the god uh, in respect and expects that the god uh, will reciprocate by similar tangible benefits. So, uh, you ask, you, you uh, offer uh, dairy products, you offer ghee, you offer uh, butter, you offer uh, animal uh, uh, in, in sacrifices and expect something very tangible in return. It could be sun, it could be uh, some uh, material wealth, it could be rain, it could be uh, something very tangible. But uh, if you uh, read Upanishads, uh, then uh, these uh, tangible aspects uh, are somewhat uh, absent here. It is uh, in the intangible terms that expectations are articulated. For instance, uh, the, the uh, person uh, offering prayer uh, to God is expecting uh, Sukh and Shanti uh, from uh, gods and uh, Sukh and uh, Shanti can vary uh, from person to person and uh, it is uh, temperamental, it is it's more abstract. So, what is uh, Sukh and Shanti for me might differ uh, in terms of what uh, it means to someone else. And uh, this, uh, this uh, abstraction uh, is something which is very uh, typical of uh, Upanishadic uh, uh, texts. Uh, also, uh, there is uh, concern with uh, Atma, Paramatma, Brahman, Srishti, Brahmand, Universe. So, uh, how did they come into being? Uh, what is the linkage between Atma and Paramatma and so forth, soul? So, uh, the, these issues are not major preoccupations in the Vedic period. Why it is that people are uh, trying to understand uh, the world around themselves in these uh, terms. Uh, this is, this is uh, something which has been studied by historians and even sociologists alike uh, to understand um, as to what is, uh, what is uh, the actual historical context uh, in which uh, such uh, changes in the religious tone and tenor can be understood. So, uh, I am not getting into the specifics of this. What, I'm, uh, what we are trying to understand is what kind of uh, uh, social and economic scenario or situation or conditions uh, or political conditions could have uh, triggered uh, such uh, response or <coughs> one can say such uh, articulations in uh, spiritual and uh, religious terms. So, uh, that, is, uh, that is something uh, which we detect uh, within the Brahmanical tradition. Now, uh, of course, apart from this, there is also uh, a very noticeable uh, change that we can uh, see in uh, 6th century BC and that is, apart from the Brahmanical way of life, uh, the Brahmanical religion which uh, itself underwent uh, uh, significant change as we just discussed uh, through Upanishad and its preoccupations. Apart from this, we also have the rise of what historians call heterodox sects. Now, what, are, what is this heterodox? Why, why do we refer to this as heterodox uh, sects? And uh, this is not only limited to uh, Buddhism and Jainism. There are several others, Ajivikas, Ajit Kesh Kambalins. Um, so, uh, um, you have a, a variety of uh, uh, religious or you can say uh, sects uh, which uh, came into being. Uh, and uh, uh, ideas which uh, worked counter to uh, the Brahmanical way of life. Uh, and uh, it was uh, therefore, it, it is uh, sought to be understood as a movement uh, against uh, Brahmanical orthodoxy. So, uh, since uh, Brahmanism was uh, born in the conditions that we are familiar with uh, in terms of Vedic times, which was uh, the, where the context is pastoral, 
village life, uh, where uh, urban life is uh, not much to be, uh, to be seen, where <coughs> urban transactions, material transactions, uh, trade and commercial activities are, um, are almost absent. Uh, it is in this context that uh, the Vedic sensibilities were born and uh, the Brahmanical uh, way of life was uh, actually anchored in, uh, this, uh, uh, in, in these conditions. But by the time we reach 6th century BC, uh, we start getting rumblings against the Brahmanical way of life, the way uh, Brahmanism uh, ordered society in the fourfold world division uh, with the Brahmins at the top and the Shudra uh, at the bottom in the uh, Varna category. Of course, there were uh, uh, social categories beyond the Varna, that is Avarna, uh, who uh, were uh, uh, who, who constituted what we know as untouchables. So, this ordering of society uh, had its own logic, uh, had its own uh, rationale, had its own historical uh, conditioning. And uh, it is uh, around 6th century BC that we start seeing for the first time in a very formidable way that uh, this ordering of society <coughs> or for that matter, uh, conceptualization of God and the philosophies associated with uh, religions, uh, Brahmanical uh, religion, they started getting countered. So, there were question marks on this. This is uh, best represented uh, in uh, <coughs> Jainism and Buddhism that we are going to explore today. Now, <coughs> in Jainism, or for that matter Buddhism, the focus is on non-violence. <coughs> the sacrifices which constituted the dominant way of uh, offering, religious offering in uh, Brahmanism, that is uh, not to be uh, followed uh, in Buddhism and Jainism. So, <coughs> why is it that uh, there is a shift away from uh, animal sacrifices uh, and there is, uh, mm, uh, there is some kind of an accentuation of, <coughs> of the idea of uh, uh, non-violence. So, these are some important points that we need to look at. <coughs> now, we have seen that uh, 6th century BC is a period where agriculture had uh, uh, finally uh, replaced uh, animal husbandry as the dominant way of life. So, more and more people are now dependent on agriculture. Agriculture has become uh, the norm so far as economic activities are concerned. <coughs> also, urban centers have, the, have uh, emerged and uh, we get to hear of uh, the 16 Mahajanapadas, which are territorial states, uh, not only uh, small territorial uh, divisions like Janapada, because uh, this, uh, this uh, transition towards state society is something which happened uh, almost in three stages. Uh, one is, of course, the precipitation of uh, uh, the uh, or, or crystallization of the Janas, which is uh, tribes uh, or clan. Uh, they got consolidated under uh, Janapadas. So, uh, several small uh, Janas uh, came together to constitute Janapad, which uh, quite unlike the Jan connotation, which is kin based becomes territory based. So, it is the birth of geography in Indian history for the first time. So, uh, instead of kin group, uh, which was the uh, basis of uh, political rule uh, in the Vedic times, now we have uh, the territory uh, inhabited by a set of Janas, which, uh, which was uh, named as a particular Janapada. 
So, uh, the connotation here is uh, uh, territorial and uh, uh, on the other hand, we also have uh, the uh, subsequent to it, uh, the second stage is the, the several Janapadas getting consolidated into Maha Janapadas. So, uh, the smaller uh, Janapadas either as a result of <coughs> willful coming together <coughs> on account of uh, several uh, instruments, it could be uh, uh, matrimonial alliance or even uh, conquest. So, uh, they all uh, came together uh, <coughs> and uh, the texts of the contemporary period uh, refer to uh, a fixed number of Mahajanapadas that is 16 in number. So, 16 Mahajanapadas uh, constituted the political landscape of uh, 6th century BC North India. <coughs> which include <coughs> which included Magadh and uh, several others. And uh, third stage of state formation in 6th century BC is uh, the period when Magadh as uh, one Mahajanapad came to have uh, significant control and uh, uh, almost hegemony <coughs> over several other Mahajanapadas. Uh, not only in the vicinity, but also uh, in the far off land. So, ultimately uh, it uh, culminated uh, into the triumphant march of one particular Mahajanapada uh, and it gave rise to uh, an empire like structure. The pinnacle of that uh, is uh, the Mauryan times, which was uh, separated from 6th century BC almost by 300 years. So, by the time we reach uh, 300 BC, we find that uh, the same set of uh, <coughs> historical and political changes uh, triggered in 6th century BC had reached that uh, pinnacle, that, uh, that final stage in the form of the Mauryan Empire, where Magadh uh, uh, as one Mahajanapada came to uh, influence and have control over a greater part of uh, the inhabited uh, land uh, and uh, we all know about the dimensions, territorial dimensions of uh, Mauryan empire. So, uh, this, is, uh, this is something uh, which we always uh, need to keep in mind. Now, let us start by understanding uh, as to what are the thrust areas of uh, Jainism and Buddhism. Uh, I am not uh, taking uh, the tenets of these religions in individual terms, but uh, I am trying to understand it as a whole as a phenomena. So, uh, Buddhism and Jainism stood for non-violence, uh, they stood for uh, opposing uh, animal sacrifices. Now, is it merely uh, one person's idea or it occurred to Buddha or Mahavir Jain that uh, we should not be uh, killing animals and uh, that is how people got so impressed and it became, uh, it became so uh, important uh, a religious tenet as such. Uh, that is not the, uh, not the prudent way to understand uh, a social phenomena. So, we must look at uh, the prevailing conditions or the changed conditions where these habits, these uh, teachings, preachings got uh, institutionalized and got uh, uh, social adherence by a good uh, number of uh, social groups. So, let us identify as to who do, uh, these uh, groups were and uh, what uh, these changed conditions were. One we have already identified agriculture has come to replace uh, pastoralism. Now, since Brahmanical way of life, Brahmanical religion is rooted in pastoral, uh, in Viran, uh, pastoral uh, we can say conditions. Uh, therefore, uh, there is some kind of an inhibition, there is some kind of a resistance to these ideas. Whereas, uh, now, in the change scenario of 6th century BC, where agriculture has become extremely important, where trade and commerce have become extremely important, uh, 
there are new issues coming up. Now, let us understand this. In a pastoral society, a cattle is valued for the milk products uh, or dairy products that, uh, that can be had from uh, uh, rearing a, a cattle. And then uh, when uh, they stop giving milk after a particular uh, age, uh, when they are past their reproductive uh, age, then they are rendered useless and hence you have uh, uh, sacrifices. Now, this is not to say that uh, this is how it actually happened. All I am hinting is that uh, these practices had its own uh, logic. Now, in Buddhism, uh, animal sacrifices is being, uh, uh, is being opposed and this is also the time of agriculture. Now, in agriculture, the cattle can be used even beyond, even after their reproductive stage, that is after they have ceased to give milk and so forth. So, they can be used for their traction power to plow the agricultural fields. And uh, that is something which was, uh, which was uh, very much in practice and hence there was some logic, there was some strong logic to not kill cattle in uh, sacrifices by the time we are talking of 6th century BC. So, that is one way in which uh, historians uh, have uh, uh, tried to understand the institutionalization of uh, these religious preachings and uh, the adherents, uh, the social adherents. Now, I uh, will come to the uh, social adherent part or the social groups who backed it up. Now, again, uh, like we did for the cattle issue or the sacrifice, animal sacrifice issue, similarly, let us understand this. Brahmanical way of life, which is in, uh, ensconced in the uh, pastoral, uh, pastoral uh, society, which is born of the pastoral conditions of the Vedic times, which has not been uh, exposed to uh, to uh, say trade and commerce as uh, the major preoccupation of people and also uh, the urban settings had its own way of ordering people and that was the fourfold one division. Uh, we are not going, getting into the justification of this, but in 6th century BC, we find that there is some kind of an unrest against the way in which four uh, social categories are ordered in a particular hierarchy right from Brahmins to Shudras. Now, why is it that it is only around this time that we uh, start getting this uh, sense of resistance? Why not in earlier times? Again, because by the time we reach 6th century BC, not only agriculture, but even trade and commerce had come to uh, significantly enrich the Vaishyas who were primarily engaged in uh, cultivation activities and who had also uh, taken to, quite a few of them had also taken to uh, uh, trade and commercial activities, trade and exchange. Now, these pursuits had resulted into uh, amassing wealth by some sections uh, who were very much good in number amongst the Vaishyas themselves. There is also some kind of a tussle which was evident even in the Vedic times between the Brahmins and the Kshatriyas which is at play and which continues even in the uh, 6th century BC. Uh, the Brahmins uh, basically giving legitimacy to the rule of the Kshatriyas who were supposed to be the uh, ruling uh, class and uh, who would, uh, uh, which constituted the pool from where the uh, Rajas would be uh, drawn. So, uh, Kshatriyas are supposed to defend the territory 
and uh, rulers are uh, drawn from the uh, pool of Kshatriyas and the Brahmins are giving legitimacy to it and the in return of giving legitimacy, uh, the Kshatriyas are also giving uh, some uh, material uh, benefit to the Brahmins. So, there is always this uh, sense of uh, tension between the two and that is something which is which goes on. This is something which can be deconstructed through several episodes of uh, uh, Ramayana and Mahabharata also. Uh, you have uh, the uh, issue of uh, Raja Janak uh, who has uh, uh, taken to probably agriculture because uh, Sita was discovered while uh, Raja Janak is doing cultivation himself. So, why would a king uh, do cultivation? So, all these uh, things similarly the uh, Parsuram uh, episode uh, is again symptomatic of uh, uh, Ram representing the Kshatriya uh, position and the uh, Brahmin position articulated by Parsuram and there is some kind of uh, uh, cooperation uh, at work, but not without tension. So, there is lot of uh, tension which is, uh, which is also visible in the relationship uh, depicted in uh, Ramayana, uh, particularly of uh, the characters that we just uh, sp spoke about. So, uh, they are symptomatic of the Brahmin uh, Kshatriya uh, tension as well. But what Buddhism and Jainism is basically saying is that let us not uh, kind of uh, deride the trade and commercial activities or those engaged in uh, uh, trade and commercial activities to the extent that it was done in the Brahmanical way of life, which was anchored in rural, uh, rural uh, uh, scenario and uh, pastoral uh, context. So, uh, what Buddhism and Jainism is saying is uh, uh, let us accept these changes uh, and uh, Buddhism instead it, it is not doing away with uh, the ordering of society altogether. So, it is not uh, as if Buddhism is uh, all against caste system. So, there is very much ordering that Buddhism does, but it is different from uh, the fourfold one division. What it does rather is that uh, in if you read Buddhist uh, texts, it usually orders society in uh, a twofold division and that is Uchkam and Nichkam. So, high works and low works and uh, the high works uh, which is uh, uh, categorized uh, as per Buddhist uh, philosophy or Buddhist preachings uh, includes quite a few uh, activities which were uh, probably new to 6th century BC and uh, uh, traders, trading, merchant, uh, merchant uh, class and so forth. They are all included in Uchakam, several artisanal activities uh, which uh, were looked down upon in the Brahmanical uh, fourfold Varna division is given place uh, of honor. Uh, in uh, Buddhist uh, twofold uh, division. Uh, and so, uh, we find that uh, quite a few occupation groups which could have emerged in 6th century BC on account of the economic and political changes that were registered around this time, they if they subscribed to the Brahmanical way of life, then they would be ordered uh, lower in the ladder. Whereas, uh, if they gravitate towards Buddhism, which is an upcoming religion around this time, then they are uh, placed uh, in the first category, in the higher category. And uh, that tells us that uh, the upcoming classes, because it is, it is these uh, artisanal groups, it is these merchant groups, it is these uh, agricultural class uh, broadly under the Vaishyas, which constituted the social base of uh, uh, Jainism and Buddhism. So, uh, in terms of social prestige, uh, they got a better bargain, so to say, uh, by uh, moving themselves close to Buddhism and Jainism as compared to Brahmanism. 
which was still anchored in uh, the uh, Vedic uh, trappings and uh, the general attitude towards uh, the changes triggered around 6th century BC in Brahmanical sources is somewhat negative. For instance, uh, the urban dwellers or the urban centers uh, are not depicted in a very positive light uh, in uh, Brahmanical sources. Uh, several occupations, just to take one example, uh, for instance, uh, prostitution itself uh, is uh, looked uh, very down upon uh, in uh, Brahmanical uh, way of life. This is not to say that uh, Buddhism and Jainism is supporting it, but if you look at the life of uh, Buddha himself, uh, Buddha was very much in uh, contact with uh, uh, the most famous of the courtesans uh, at Vaishali, that is Amra, uh, Amrapali. Uh, also, uh, several very important, let us understand that Buddha himself is coming from uh, the, uh, the Janatantra tradition or uh, uh, Ganaraja tradition, which is a republican way of life where uh, authoritarian absolute uh, king is, uh, is not uh, uh, the order of the day, rather uh, it, is, uh, it is somewhat uh, uh, tribal oligarchy kind of a uh, thing where king is uh, elected or at least there is uh, this pretense of uh, uh, getting him elected and so forth. But definitely it was not uh, quite uh, like the way it was in Bhagat or Koshal. Uh, so, uh, Bimbisar or Ajat Shatru were uh, coming from a different tradition, the, the Magadhan tradition of absolute rule and so forth, which represented the monarchical way of uh, polity. Whereas, uh, uh, Buddha himself came from the tribal oligarchical form of polity. And uh, therefore, there is this difference between uh, uh, Samrajya and Ganarajya, which uh, of course subsequently unfolded in Indian history. The point we are making here is that despite Buddha coming from the royal family, uh, tribal oligarchical royal family, he has very good relation with uh, the uh, monarchical uh, uh, despots, so to say, uh, be it uh, Bimbisar, be it Ajata Shatru or Prashenjit from uh, Koshal. So he is in touch with uh, uh, these people, also with several other uh, traders and merchants. Uh, who uh, are doing extremely good uh, financially uh, around the, the century and uh, who are not given uh, that much of uh, social respect uh, commensurate with uh, their uh, economic earnings or financial earnings in uh, Brahmanical uh, social division. Uh, whereas, uh, similarly, uh, we spoke of uh, Amrapali. So, uh, Buddha is uh, supposed to be engaging all these people uh, in his own lifetime in a rather uh, convenient way. And uh, there is no kind of uh, sense of rancor with, with which uh, he transacts with these people. Uh, in a way, uh, although it is it's, uh, like uh, uh, generalizing it, uh, but for, for uh, understanding purpose, one can say that the triumphant uh, social categories or social powers uh, are with uh, Buddha and Jain uh, around this time. And it is, uh, it is the, uh, it is the uh, we can say, uh, declining uh, social groups. Uh, which, uh, which are still anchored to uh, Brahmanism around this time. Of course, subsequently when we move, we find again uh, the Buddhist and Jain practices uh, over a period of time, by the time we reach uh, the post modern period or Gupta period and so forth, we find that these uh, religions had become organized, had uh, divided into several sects <coughs> and uh, had got ossified. Uh, the dynamism was lost sight of, uh, rituals had uh, come to uh, uh, encircle uh, their uh, religious operations and uh, it was again uh, Brahminism in a very new avatar we can say 
<coughs> that came to almost incorporate uh, the Buddhist and uh, Jain practices within itself. Uh, but that was, uh, that was to happen uh, only subsequently. So far as 6th century BC is concerned, we find that uh, the uh, upcoming social groups as we identified merchants, traders, uh, new occupational, urban occupational groups, uh, they all are uh, finding uh, a better uh, social bargain uh, in uh, Buddhism and Jainism. Uh, for instance, money lending. Now, money lending is part and parcel of uh, any economic uh, uh, transaction or we can say trade and commerce can't thrive without, without it. Now, money lending is, uh, it is not as if Buddha is saying that one should be uh, charging uh, interest on uh, the money which is uh, lent to uh, someone else. <coughs> but the attitude that uh, Buddhism displays uh, towards uh, uh, money lenders, those who charge interest uh, on lending money, is somewhat, uh, uh, is somewhat uh, not as, uh, we can say, harsh as it appears uh, in uh, Brahmanism. Similarly, uh, the way uh, urban dwellers are depicted as uh, morally decadent and uh, uh, people who had uh, fallen from grace and so forth in Brahmanical sources. Now, these urban dwellers are very much accepted. Uh, it is, it is uh, the, the sense of legitimacy that Buddhism and Jainism gives uh, to uh, urban dwellers is far uh, more uh, uh, acceptable, uh, the tone and tenor is more acceptable uh, as compared to uh, Brahmanism. So, uh, all these uh, things do tell us, be it uh, animal sacrifice, be it social ordering, be it the new way of life, uh, the urban way of life, trade and commerce, uh, agriculture, uh, the cattle associated with it. Uh, its uh, usage in uh, ploughing the field and so forth. When we look at the total scenario uh, at a very general level, we discover that uh, the key to success of uh, Buddhism and Jainism uh, must have laid uh, in these uh, changes and the resultant attitude towards these changes which appeared to be more uh, accepting uh, in the case of uh, Buddhism and Jainism, whereas Brahmanism, since it was uh, rooted in uh, a different ethos altogether, therefore, its attitude uh, to these changes around this time appears to be somewhat negative. Also important is the fact uh, that the way Buddha, uh, uh, Mahavir uh, uh, Jain and Gautama Buddha went about spreading uh, their ideas, religious ideas, that also uh, has uh, some element of, uh, uh, you can say, strategy that we can see so far as uh, their popularities are concerned. For instance, uh, in spreading or in preaching, uh, Gautam Buddha himself used Pali as uh, the uh, language. Now, Pali is the uh, lingua franca, you can say, of 6th century BC uh, Bihar area or eastern Uttar Pradesh area. So, uh, people spoke in these languages and it is not a theoretical uh, kind of uh, uh, language in which they were transacting. Similarly, uh, Mahavir Jain uh, is, using, is using Prakrit and that is also spoken uh, language of the masses and it is not uh, the pristine, theoretically uh, sound uh, Sanskrit language that they were using to transact their religious teachings in contrast to Brahmanism, which was still uh, using Sanskrit as the medium to reach out to people. So, uh, these two uh, leaders could reach out to people, could connect with people in a better way and uh, uh, lead to a movement-like situation uh, as compared to uh, uh, Brahmanism, which was uh, still using Sanskrit. So, uh, what we have done today is we have looked at all the historical, 
uh, factors, the historical conditions and also uh, the uh, strategies in terms of uh, uh, spreading uh, the tenets, uh, religious tenets and uh, uh, quite a few other settings that we just spoke of, uh, they all actually contributed in a big way towards uh, making uh, Buddhism and Jainism uh, a success uh, as a social movement, as a religious movement around this time. Of course, when we move into history, we find uh, quite a few things happening right. to these two religions right. subsequently as thank, well. Thank you, sir, and uh, sorry for interrupting you, but uh, with the time constraints, we have to bring the lecture to a close. So again, thank you, sir. Thank you for being here, and thank you, friends, for watching. Have a wonderful day.